Ignition sequence start. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. That's the amazing thing about being right here right now, because I'm surrounded by what seems to be the year fun. It's going to have a lot of different layers to it. There's a few different ways that like you can create an idea with something like this. And you can kind of like know the, the different parts that you want to use and the different cables and structures of data that you're going to have to use. And, and you kind of take it from sort of the finish line to the beginning. You kind of write it backwards. <laughs> It's an augmented reality piece, which means that you can actually see the surroundings and see the people here. And then on top of that is an extra virtual layer of our computer graphic fish. So you can direct the fish and get them to follow you. But the more you do that, the more you intervene in the natural order of things, the more they'll turn into plastic garbage. We're working on another interactive projection with this time a depth sensor. So we have a projection that we're utilizing on the right half of the lake and the left half of the lake. And what it's doing is kind of mimicking the right and left half of the brain. We've been affected by the constant intake of media and information. You know, it's our attention spans and repetitive thoughts and chemicals released in our brain every time we get a notification sound. What's interesting here at Alice Beach is the amount of international details that can make you feel like you're not in the U.S. anymore. It's really unique. The buildings, they're stuck with this reflective white material to reflect light to keep the heat down in the home. And the homes themselves, this kind of new urban style of architecture, great place to see how to experiment and how these artists are able to work with the location. It's a completely interactive piece, and so when someone swings, particles sort of explode, and there's also a soundscape that goes with it. So as you swing back and forth on the swings, uh, different notes will play depending on how high you swung on it. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Ahead of the Curve. I'm just going to pause the video here really quickly, but I wanted to welcome you all here for a very special episode with my good friend Brett Ferris uh, from General Anxiety, who is the hey. curator. Hey, how are you? Good, thanks. Welcome to the show. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> This is, I mean, you know, stunned again, seeing the intro, it helps me do uh, better work. Thank you for showing that. No, absolutely. I wanted to at least give the viewers kind of a little bit of a, you know, a, a showing of what we're going to be talking about today yeah. and give people a general introduction of what uh, digital graffiti is all about. Hey, Helen. <laughs> hey, Julia. Thanks for tuning in. And for the support, Sergio, of course, dude, here every week. Uh, <laughs> DG, of course, is you know one of the topics we're definitely going to be talking about here today. Yes. Sir. So, Brett, welcome, man. I just wanted to um, to thank you for for joining me on the show today. As you know, we've been doing this every single week, bringing on different people 
uh, from technical backgrounds and visual artists and kind of been all over the place, bringing different people on uh, from different industries. And it's just an honor to have you on board with me today. So just to kick things off, can you just give us a little kind of insight as to who you are, how you got into this, how you started curating art, uh, how you got into the digital art field and all that good stuff? It's a tall order, man. <laughs> um, yeah, well, so I guess in terms of just DG itself, thanks. Um, that was an accident. I was teaching full time, uh, <laughs> like 2007, 2008, and I uh, was asked to, uh, you know, validate this project. So that was not planned to be a curator, um, but I think it comes along with the territory when you have been, you know training your eye for as many decades, I guess, as I've been, um, it makes it simpler to look and see the magic, I guess, that's in the art and what the artist is up to and kind of pick away or pull away the people that um, might not have it figured out just yet, and for, you know, to those that just got something really interesting going on. So cool. how I got here, I mean, I, those are, <sighs> you don't really want to hear that stuff, do you? <laughs> Well, what about your background? You know, like you've dabbled around in in a bunch of different startups and right. Well, you've worked. so it's true that I mean, I, I started, uh, you know, in computer using computers and graphics in the '80s, and um, you know, I taught Quark, um, you know, <laughs> grad school. That uh, once that I got through that first run, that first tour in art history. Uh, the first job two weeks out was working for a startup uh, well, there was a multimedia database of visual art in 1990. So they did have a claim to doing something pretty pretty new. Um, Kodak was interested in the work. It just uh, really got me going with startup activity. Love the idea because it combined all of my you know backgrounds in art practice, art history, and technology. So that's how it's just kind of, it's all been kicked down the road at the same time, somehow. And digital graffiti itself uh, is a great culmination of it as well. And to be able to continue to stay, I guess, as you say, the head of the curve, see what's going on. <laughs> nice plug. <laughs> yes, sir. working on it. So, you know, part of the thing that really attracted me to digital graffiti, of course, was the whole environment of it and the vibe and, you know, like, the experiencing all these wonderful pieces of art that had been brought in from different artists from all over the world. And, you know, I remember that that first weekend kind of coming up uh, on the terrace with you at Kaliza with, with Kayla and, you know, and uh, Tracy kind of hurtling off and hurtling her off and taking care of her. And, you know, there's just all this stuff going on, but it was super magical to walk around that, that, place to walk around Alice Beach and and experience all of this art and be immersed by it, you know, and um, it, it's a special magical place. I mean, we got hooked. I could see Dan Roboto is actually joined us in here today. And, you know, like it's it's that whole sense of building the community. And once you're there and once you're in it, you don't want to go away. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> it's true. Um, if, but then we'd be Disneyland or something, right? That wouldn't be right either. I mean, I, I dig the, the, the sort of unique quality. I mean, it is scarce material. Um, you're able, well, for those that haven't gone to DG, I mean, there is this uh, entrance that everyone sort of waits at, right? And they get a chance to uh, enjoy. They don't know what they're going to enjoy altogether. But there are some responsive artworks. There can be this, these massive projections, but massive to the scale of the, of the homes. It is not something that is about Disney or it's not about projecting onto a Coca-Cola headquarters. Um, it is about an intimacy. So artists get a chance to see their work in a way that they may not have ever seen it before. Um, but with this kind of backdrop, they're able to see other details again that just sort of sets them thinking about future kinds of work. So when you're standing there waiting for the gates to drop, and this is part of this week, you know, where we're supposed to be, um, the gates drop this week to DG from home. Yeah. So, 
Yeah, yeah. and I mean, it's, 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 it's got another element to this whole festival that's awesome. But, you know, you create your own path at that point. The festival has a kind of um, a path through it, though. It does go through different parts of Alice Beach. These homes are unique unto themselves, as the, as the explainer sort of pointed out. I mean, all the homes being sort of stuccoed, this reflective white, just makes it so much easier for that light to bounce off and back into your eye. I mean, it's, it's funny when, you, you know, you had Christie Digital set up out there. You brought out the big guns. and you yeah, the We definitely didn't back. need them. <laughs> it was too bright. I mean, you dialed them back at least by half. So um, that's because also there's no light pollution. It's not in a city. It doesn't, you know, you don't have to compete with a lot of different elements. And then also the architecture being just closely shoulder to shoulder makes a big difference. It's almost like being in a gallery outside. You don't have to walk blocks and blocks to the next exhibit, so to speak, at an outdoor festival that might happen, say, in Cincinnati. So you walk along that ped path, um, you continue to just catch everything. It sets your brain sort of uh, in park and you're able to see that much more, just that much more light, that's much more activity. On Friday nights, it's family night. So it's a lot more sort of fun. You got to see the swing set. Um, there is that element of just fun. And then there's Saturday night, which is over 21. It's got that more immersive quality um, where you're able to have a glass of wine, have some food, wander around. And then- My, my personal favorite night, of course. <laughs> It's my personal favorite because it's the, it's the one night I get to enjoy it completely, not worried, you know, concerned about anything other than just getting to see it um, as it is. Yeah, Saturday night's, Saturday night's great. Um, it's uh, weaving, meandering in, in some respects, goes around a lake, goes over a bridge, past a tower. Um, all these different structures can be hit um, depending on the art that we get. Uh, through the open submission process on one hand. Um, and then we've got these residency artists that fill in other spots, ending in this area called Kaliza Pool that uh, becomes- 2019 uh, indeed, uh, Helen, sorry. Well, no, no, like you said, that's where the terrace is. That's where you got the chance to have a bird's eye view on uh, what's going on with this whole festival. So it's evolved, you know, over the years. Um, we, of course, didn't know exactly what we were up to that first year, 2008. We did um, have everything from a music video that took best of show to uh, an infomercial, 30 minute infomercial. So we were just putting everything up we could to see what was going to, you know, what was going to stick as it were. But um, they also just had lots of white walls. And that was different too, because it, it made us think more in terms of a drive in theater. Uh, that would not be where it is today, where we had to get used to projecting onto all materials, including trees, bushes, uh, all doors, windows. And it does put off some artists who think still that they should just get a white wall. It's just not a happening thing anymore. But I- there was, there was also the time of like projecting on the water tower, right? So that was, that yeah. was pretty ambitious. Well, we did it the first year. I mean, we didn't do it, actually. There was a, uh, a group came up from Miami. They drove up in a van. I mean, true guerrilla tactic, um, just went over there and projected onto the tower. They had their own batteries. I mean, they did it. That's exactly the spirit, what it was. Um, but as you say, we did take uh, an artist, Keaton Fox's work and projected on a tower. It looked great. So... We've opened up our way of thinking about it. Um, I don't know that everybody, I mean, you know, thinks about this stuff still the same way that even when you see a projector, I think people think of conference rooms. But the moment you start pointing on the ceiling or pointing it on the ground, people start getting it. They start wanting to play themselves. Yeah, well, it, it kind of it definitely brings in the more artistic side of it, you know, yeah. like it brings it away from being a conventional tool as opposed to, to being more of a creative tool. Like be, it becomes a paintbrush, so to speak. Well, so for the open submissions, and this is changing um, more too, 
that uh, you know artists don't always know where it's going to go. That's kind of up to my uh, the latitude. And it's sometimes, you know, problematic, but at other times it's just these amazing surprises, these accidents that I wasn't expecting. I mean, I've, I should know a little bit about Alice Beach over the last dozen plus years, but I'm always surprised at what details I've just been missing. Um, there was a work from Lucina Adams that projected inside of a courtyard a few years ago, and um, you know, it was I made it life scale. It was a it was a guy running in place, kept falling down. It was an interesting video, um, but life size around this courtyard sort of uh, waiting pool. But what happened is that there was reflection from the projector on the wall, hit off to a 45 degree angle onto a window next to the projection, which then made this guy look like a hologram. And that was like as if he was in the window. So it was a surprise that um, it just makes me want to explore these different, you know, nooks and crannies that much more around Alice Beach. But it does get the artist thinking more about what can happen. So we are seeing more proposals. People have been, you know, at the town. They want to be able to kind of take hold more. This is something that artists, you know, haven't always had to work with either. They're, they're used to flat surfaces. They're now having to speak a language where it's just multifaceted, truly. I mean, literally, not just figuratively. Uh, <laughs> a way that these facets talk. No, it's, it's huge. I mean, it's great to see artists finally doing it, um, having conversations with these different facets. So I know that's not something from where you come from is that unique. But with Alice Beach... I mean, we, we have a lot of different walls, you know, but they've all normally just been taken up one facet at a time. That's changing. But it's, it's, a, it's a good dynamic for artists to get a hold of. It just helps them with their own work as well. No, absolutely. So I think this is a good segue to start talking about, like, uh, what people can, like, DG at home. Yeah. And, and what's kind of going on with that? Because that really kind of got my brain thinking as soon as it was introduced. I was like, oh, wow, this is a great way to take kind of, you know, something that was supposed to happen, of course, this weekend and virtualize it and turning it into something that people can still experience these great art pieces from artists from around the world, but they can experience different pieces of, the, you know, what would be the festival back at home. Right. Well, and so, um, as you say, there, there's been a lot of movement. I mean, first of all, it starts with the postponement, uh, with the pause. Uh, DG is slated to happen in October. Yeah. Um, as you say, there was something going on this week that we didn't want people to forget that we had forgotten <laughs> that was happening. But, uh, but, the, but the idea of getting people away from their laptop from the desktop away from that TV on the wall, I think is huge. It's a great antidote to this whole pandemic issue of staying at home that you can take, I mean, you gotta grab a projector um, and get it outside and start projecting on anything. It's just reminding you, I mean, there, there's this world outside of course, but that you can see your front yard, your, 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 the street out front in a totally different way. And as you say, the, the, the art that we posted, you know, in the compilation reel uh, was great, you know, through the generosity of, of past artists uh, to give us permission to use it. We are, you know, holding off on showing 2020 artists yet, just yet. So um, there is some other work that's on that reel that, like with Helen from the UK, she uh, got to see an animation of a moth inside of a port, uh, like a, it's a balcony, but it's set back from mm -hmm. the street in at Alice Beach. But it was super cool to see the way that the moth would sort of light up, you know, in its flutter, the sort of, this small sort of, uh, gal um, I keep on saying gallery, but this balcony space. Um, that's what people need to do, but I don't think that anybody had that reminder. In the art world, everybody was doing virtual galleries. Yeah. Doing VR, you know, in a, you know, in a museum. Um, this is physical reality. And it's taking, you know, textures that you might think of in, if you're from the 3D world and putting them on a physical built environment. Um, 
there's a completely different magic there. And I'm hoping people get a chance to do it because one of the things that I've shown, and I don't have it nearby, but I mean, that these projectors are so tiny, have their own battery, and you connect it to your phone, you really can get around anywhere in the yard, um, wherever you are. You just get to see some things that just don't happen on a flat screen. And then, no, it's true. It's, it's true. I think I actually got a video clip of uh, like a little video clip too. I'll queue up for a little bit later, but I've got that little example that you you sent me earlier. Oh, okay, right. No, I mean it's um, it's really important to experience this stuff with your body. You you, I mean, it's frustrating to try to get shots of these things in the in in the night, as it were. And if you don't think about getting an Instagram moment and you just appreciate this for yourself in your own senses, um, it's so much better. And I think that that's what's unique about it all. I mean, you're reminding people about DG, but you're reminding people that art needs to be witnessed physically. No, absolutely. I mean, that's that, that was uh, the point that I was actually going to start talking about next was just the the physicality of being and witnessing something in person, you know, that's one part I, I would say from the live events field and the live events industry, including digital art, um, that people need to be there to engage and to feel it. You know, we sense things and we feel things as a community, um, especially when we're building these micro communities, when we're going to these events and we're, when we're feeling, feeling the feelings that we have while we're there, you know, just like, as I mentioned a little bit earlier about um, uh, about being at DG for that first time, well, first time and every time thereafter, you know, you like, it's that feeling of community, the feeling of being in there and it takes you away from everything else. And, Entire. you know, pardon? Parks, it, well, that's the thing I was alluding to is it really does sort of hijack executive function in the brain. <laughs> It does let you stop thinking about things that you really have no business thinking about. You're supposed to be in this one place, and why are you thinking about <laughs> this other thing at this other location? Why are you thinking um, about the Roadrunner right now and Wiley Coyote in a mad chase? Not going to happen. That's, that's the, that is the best part. We just take <laughs> that brain and sort of wrestle it to a place we want it to be. It's good. Um, and it's it necessary because... That embodied presence, that's what makes VR really interesting. But it's just too hard, obviously, to get onto, you know, like you say, onto the head of a community. So when you're able to just have a conversation in real time about something that you, it's right there in front of you, it confirms so much about your being. It's important. It's not something you can fob off. It's not, it's, it's something that matters and your body knows it. So I have an interesting question to pose actually to the people watching, and that's have, have you guys experienced anything since COVID's come into place? Have you guys experienced anything live in a live setting? Have you experienced any, uh, seen any digital art or any projection mapping or anything in your areas? Um, I'm finding it interesting because last night, you know, we took on the initiative, Susie and I went out, as I mentioned yesterday into our yard and we took the reel and we threw it up on the side of the house and you know, it was amazing. Like I put a little post up in a little app called Neighborhood where I could tell the, our neighbors that we're gonna be doing something cool and projecting some art on the house. And, you know, we, we sat outside at a table at the end of the lawn and, you know, threw up some art and we had people coming by and the, the feedback was incredible and the engagement was awesome. And uh, we got to meet a whole bunch of neighbors that we never we never knew before too, and we had some really interesting and engaging conversation, not only about um, you know us being neighbors and where we're from and all that stuff, but about the art itself. And it really it was really cool to to be able to experience that. And for you know for us, it was the first thing that we've done where we've been directly engaging with other people kind of in that live setting um, and by, by not going out to a festival or not going out to a concert or anything like that, you know? So it's, it's, it's really cool, this whole initiative. And I think that there's like, there's traction here. 
No, agreed. I, you know, want to showcase every single artist on that compilation reel. And so it's going to take me a month plus to get it done. <laughs> but I'm going to do it because I think it's that important. And I want to make sure that, you know, obviously the artists get their, their props, but that people know that this is something that should be done on a daily <laughs> basis, especially right now. It just doesn't make any sense to kind of keep it to yourself. Um, and, and that's a problem for me. I'm upstate New York, right? I don't have that many people. When I talk about projecting on a neighbor, that's a big deal right now. I don't have too many people to do this with. But when I went out front to just project onto a tree, it is amazing. And this is my little, you know, this is my little gem. It's not going to happen for anybody else. I hope people get that. They should be out there doing this on their own. Yeah, absolutely. You know, Isabel said none whatsoever in New York City. Uh, Alexis uh, said that she would, they did the same um, and watched the loop and really talked about the art, which is awesome. You know, that's what it's all about for sure. And I would think that, you know, in, in New York City, it might be a little more challenging depending on what you're doing, but I think you might be able to get a little creative without causing too much of an uproar. <laughs> You can project onto the sidewalk easily just, I mean, you know, I guess that might be the next thing is just get your hands on a projector. But this, this is the thing. If, if you're Isabel, interested, you should. it's a link to a, a projector that I've been using. Um, it's really reasonably priced just to start having some fun immediately. It, and it gets your name around the neighborhood. Yeah, no kidding. No kidding. I mean, the feedback that we got again was incredible. We've already been asked if we could do it again and uh you know start doing some more so we're like yeah sure cool we'll definitely you know start working on that and doing more it's, it's true but it's you know i'm finding that it's like becoming as we kind of predicted a little bit earlier more individualized we're having these more individualized moments um in a smaller more tight-knit community well, that where was cool. that was cool it's usually making your own <laughs> digital art in the background. Oh, that was spooky. <laughs> We're adding a little bit more to the show. Data hole. Yeah, something. But well, you know, so as a segue, as a segue of a segue, um, one of the things that's also different with there's a lot of services that allow you to have art in your home, um, like sedition.com and uh, some others out there. And I think that the difference too is that the, the the art is locked in on a monitor it's got these constraints um that when you take the art outside it just doesn't you can start you know finding if you need a flat wall which is a little too easy um you'll find it but using this you know reel just to get outside i think it it'll also make the artist that much happier too it's kind of tough when you're an artist and you, you just see your work you know just sort of put up on a a data monitor because then that's when people say oh that's a that looks like that's a very nice screensaver and i don't think there's anything negative about it but it does kind of produce this boundary that shouldn't have to exist that when you get this stuff on a projector that's when you can go big Literally no absolutely bigger. well it, you know you add a whole different flair to it right as opposed to it's nice it's definitely really good to be able to have really nice curated art at home there's no doubt about it but being able to get outside and being able to curate things and being able to explore and experiment it it also raises people's curiosities so you get people yeah. coming around by nature you know like that was one of the really cool things about that i found about setting up for art festivals for digital art festivals or mapping festivals is um, you're during the setup time when you've got those projectors on and you're shooting at whatever you're working on, people are coming around and they're curious. And you know, there's been people that I've I've had that have just sat on the sidewalk and watched for hours as we're aligning up grids on buildings and stuff like that. And you know, they they're really curious. And I think that it's 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 a really great way to kind of play on things um, to bring people closer, but to also introduce them to the art. And and um, as <laughs> I was just reading at the bottom, yeah, it's challenge yourself, absolutely. And I think that's what I was kind of getting to is bringing those projectors, bringing projectors into play, 
Um, even some different displays and abstract displays, you know, there's a lot of flexible LED products that are coming into play now that could be really interesting, but sure. wrapping things in, an, in, in, I guess, more organic ways on different pieces and just playing and experimenting. I mean, that's part of the fun. Um, and it brings up even those, you know, around the holidays, these uh, inexpensive projectors with just snowflakes on them, they do get people talking. It's yeah, good. and I mean, they're I hope people now, are like they're a few hundred bucks, and you can get a four thousand lumen, you know, boardroom style projector that you can easily, you easily run around with, or yeah. if you, as you were mentioning, little hamburger style battery operated projectors, um, the little LED projectors that you can run around with as well, and just stack it, plug it into your phone, and and go nuts. Yeah, that's important right now. We need to go nuts. <laughs> So uh, out of out of curiosity, you know, like in terms of artist submissions and people submitting to digital graffiti. So digital graffiti right now is kind of is, from my understanding, is set for this year. Right. Right. Do you guys have any other initiatives that are going on right now um, for artists that are also viewing from home about ways that they can also engage or um, things that they can do? to kind of like draw in more of that, that sense or? Well, normally the open submissions start in September. So actually we might start taking <laughs> submissions <laughs> before 2020 starts. <laughs> so that's still not a bad way. I mean, as an activity goes, get yourself ready for September. Uh, that's when we released open submissions last year. So um, do we have any other activities? Not as such, but it doesn't mean it can't happen. I mean, DG from home should now be a year round activity. Uh, maybe that's something that uh, artists can then start. I mean, it doesn't have to be DG necessarily, but just projection from home at least. But there is the residency program that we've got going on as well. And that's, born out of you know getting to know artists making sure that uh, there's a confidence a level of confidence to have their work i mean that was the reason originally to, to start it i wanted security going into the festival knowing i had some art that would be responsive let's say it would do something more than the usual uh submissions so there's a few different things going on every year um, there's also a program that John Collette at SCAD runs, right? Oh, cool. Yeah. I mean, I was involved in a, a crit earlier today with his class, which was great. It was lots of fun to see what they're up to because they're, they're putting together the butteries, the art for the butteries at the different, at the two entrances to Alice Beach on 30A. So, um, so students are getting involved in lots of different ways as well. Um, what other activities? I know that there's some people from Alice Beach on here. What other <laughs> things am I missing here? <laughs> but I think that, you know, like in general, um, I've been talking a lot with other guests about, uh, you know, virtualizing things, virtualizing events. There's a lot of uh, uncertainty as to how the live events industry is going to come back, what capacity mm -hmm. it's going to come back in. Um, just because, of course, we can't congregate as we used to. We can't form these mammoth crowds like we used to. And the one thing that really got my, you know, really got my wheels turning again last night was like the viability of these smaller events and the viability of creating these smaller versions or nested versions or even community versions of events. Well, and well go ahead. I'm sorry. I was just going to say, like, what were, what are your thoughts on on that kind of idea, that kind of theory? Well, no, they're they're locked in with the, the migration of people right now, right? There's huge talk about how people are leaving New York City and going upstate, going to different locations around it, simply because companies are saying they're not going to return to their offices. So if that's true you will have people inhabiting these different hamlets, these different towns um, that make it easier to justify. I mean, having these, these festivals makes complete sense. It, the one problem, of course, has just been cost. The hardware has always been 
expensive, but if you if you can do it, especially in a town that's away from a city center that doesn't have the same kind of ambient light, and uh, let's say these projector costs just keep coming down, I mean they're not they're, they're, they might be held artificially, right? Well, <laughs> yeah. Have. So I mean that will help little towns put on their own festivals for sure. It's just no, a I cost issue for me. It's been the normal comment. It's not altogether easy to put them on, but I could see having a kind of squadron of, uh, of community members being armed with these little projectors and doing light shows with that. It sort of ends up being like the, the re more recent drone shows, but just people doing things with light, with art on those projectors. It's gotta happen now. I yeah, I agree. I think it's, ago, it the happened. timing is really good. And, you know, as I've said so many times before, it's uh, it's still a time to experiment and explore these different avenues, you know, where we're looking at changing things around and changing things up um, and adapting to the life that we're living in. So, because, yeah. you know, there's really no true, there's no true direction as of yet as to, you know, where there might be a point where life could go back to quote unquote normal. So it's definitely a time for exploration and a time to um, continually to create and uh, do different things. And I've just, uh, again, I've just really liked the idea of, um, of building that kind of micro community where you can have art easily accessible, but not have these mass amounts of people um right oh that, tracy posed a pretty good question that she's seen a lot more artists uh selling their bodies of work to be packaged from home and she's asking if that is a is that a trend that may help well so that's i mean for digital art definitely there are these different resources out there it hasn't been easy because I think it competes with Netflix to, to begin with. People don't understand why they should necessarily license it. They're there. Um, so Tracy, you're right. I mean, they, they might need to be packaged in a way that uh, people see how they can be outside that monitor. Because I think that the whole film slash TV context sort of makes it difficult for art to be seen in its own light. Um, but getting those well, and if you start showing projectors taking it to different places in the home, it should make it easier for people to see the art in a different way. Because I don't know how many of you have a separate monitor in your home in a hallway that just shows digital art on it. Well, there's the picture frames, right? Like we have digital picture frames yeah. um, I mean, here at the house. You have a, a 55 or a 65 inch TV hanging in a hallway that's not being used as a TV. It, it, that, it's a weird, I mean, it's happening, but it's, um, it just hasn't caught on like everybody had hoped years ago. So it, th again, this is the time, why not? This is the silver lining for a lot of different moments for artists to finally get to, to be seen outside of the usual uh, venue that they've been sort of boxed in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah you know it's complicated it's um it's even the idea of trying to show how simple it should be to get a projector and plug it in to some media um it's just not natural but it's just as easy as plugging a tv but i don't know how natural that is either yeah i think like helen actually posed an interesting uh point about drive throughs and there's been a lot of talk about concerts going in that direction which I'm not a I'm not really sold on that whole idea of driving up to a venue in your car and listening to a concert. You know, um, maybe in some forms, digital art could be adapted that way. What are your thoughts on that? On maybe doing a drive around or a, a drive through style art festival? It's happening. There there are different artist collectives that are trying it. Um, I think. The, the thing that on one hand is, is something we're gonna have to just learn to live with and around and through is that at least in a cinema, you're with people, it's that community again. 
But um, when you're experiencing music, there is a community around you. To mm -hmm. be experiencing it in a car is kind of a drag to be isolated from it. On the other hand, if your car has got, you know, a fancy sound system, it's pretty amazing to watch the Met, you know, the opera with surround sound, because then you get to hear audio the way you haven't heard it before. Also, you know, there are concerts happening like in Fortnite. That, yep, virtual that, concerts, virtual right, events. That, it, again, if it were engineered for sound, I think it'd be pretty amazing. But it's still like if you can have your avatar turn to somebody and actually be sharing the same angle or the same, almost the same angle onto, say, the performer, that helps. But until we get to that place where, I mean, I'd like to know how many of you have been in, it doesn't have to be VR, but how many of you have been inside of an environment, a digital environment with avatars to look, you know, and converse with? Anybody? I mean, I mean, it's like crickets. No, I think that's a good question because, you know, like Facebook is trying it. Facebook's got a project called uh, Horizon that they're working on, which is supposed to be basically a fully augmented um, mm. or virtual environment where right. everybody has their own avatars and you, you kind of intervene. Like they're basically building the Oasis from Ready Player One. Well, or like you say, second in life. Um, second, the people that ran Second Life have, I think it's Science Space. It's the same idea it, as you put it, but it's there are these. In the, it's necessary to have these sort of detuned avatars. It's not exactly Ready Player. Or, yeah, Ready Player One yet, but um, <laughs> Isabel actually mentioned yes. Yeah, so Isabel, I don't know if you could elaborate on that um, think, as to yeah. how you how you've experienced it. Where did you find? Yeah, what did you experience? Yeah. Because that would be definitely something that would be really interesting to explore. Uh, there's a, another product that I wanted to talk about. Like I, we haven't really talked about tech very much, but um, you know, with a lot of my background being technical, but uh, I was just thinking in the back of my head that Lightform is also an interesting product that could be brought into play for people to also that people have access to and they could they could easily utilize to play and experiment with things around their um, their home and even right. outdoor, like it gives people that don't know how to do mapping a way to at least start somewhere in an easier setting. Did you see light? I mean, Lightform combined the projector with the uh, Lightform beam. The yeah, I mean, it's kind of a yeah. Gotten like trying to make it more convenient. It's gotten more complicated to just buy what you need, what you think you need. Isabel, it's good to see, like you say, Second Life. Another thing I'm going to mention about Second Life, I don't mean to derail the technology. No, 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 of course not. Moment, <laughs> That's what the that, discussion's about. That, well, but the Second Life was really important for a number of reasons. You know, I don't know, what were we talking, like 12 years ago or something? But one of the interesting things about Second Life at the time, too, was being able to fly, let's say, um, when physically you're disabled and you might not have access to legs that there are these different um, opportunities now for everybody to experience these things outside, um, to see plants come alive in ways they hadn't seen before. And that's also happening in Second Life, that, you know, we can, I, I can approximate DG a lot more easily inside of a virtual environment and, and have those experiences but it's funny, like I saw Tracy mentioned that she would never go to a virtual uh, concert. I think that there's a lot of enhancements that will make it amazing to do. I think that if you could truly immerse somebody in it to a point where they feel comfortable in the crowd. Yeah. and you're in a crowd and, you know, the things that I like about it is that you could create environments that can't exist in reality in virtual reality. You can do things that defy physics. You can do things that you can't normally do, you know, which I think might be weird when you first experience it, but really cool in a lot of other ways. Those concerts in Fortnite, amazing. The, the, the <laughs> scale that they're doing. I mean, it's like all of a sudden Godzilla appears before you and it just freaks out everybody, you know, in the environment um, in a good way. But I mean, there are some, like you say, some things that can happen. I guess that's all of the, the, the film you just mentioned, Ready Player 
I'm having Ready Player Go. What is it? I'm Ready Player One. Ready Player One. Yeah. The, yeah. There was a story. Ready Player. I don't know. Anyway, yeah. Ready Player One. That that is the next step, but it is about being able to experience the people you're with in a in a real time way. That's the problem aspect. But I can see the enhancement for sure. It's um, enticing, given that, the, like you say, the the kind of drug like aspect that technology exerts on us. To just get in it. Yeah, it's definitely <laughs> crazy. <laughs> well, Brett, I, we're going to keep this open for uh, for Q and A, but uh, we are going to cut off at least this part of the the session. So I just wanted to thank everybody once again for all of your support uh, for coming and joining us here today. Next week, um, I have a little bit of a spoiler from G DG that's going to be on, one of the resident artists. Uh, Finn Ross is going to be on with us uh, next week. And it's going to be a really cool conversation. Uh, for those who don't know Finn, he is a very well-known video designer uh, inside the theater world, uh, has won a number of awards. So it's going to be a really cool conversation for next week as well. Really honored to have him on as a guest. But I just wanted to thank you guys for coming and tuning in again. And of course, stay ahead of the curve. But in the meantime, we're going to stay on with Brett and uh, just kind of continue the conversation. Um, if you guys have any other questions, um, please pose them. Uh, and, and again, if you want to reach Brett, you can also check out his site at www.genanxiety.com. Yay, Finn. Yay, Ben. Brett, can you elaborate on some of your artwork? Wow, that'd be interesting and nice. <laughs> um, well, I mean, so if you go to genanxiety.com, there, there's a link um, in the, the about section to my personal site, um, brettferris.org. Uh, the work I do is in a game engine, so it doesn't lend itself to, well, I mean, it's, it's this changing. The so what game engine are you using? What game engine? I'm using Unity. Nothing sexy. Just you know. Hey, Unity can be very sexy. It's a. <laughs> it's been in it so long, but um, it, it's a it's a workhorse for me. But um, it allows me to like get responsive when I want to get responsive instead of having to use a separate piece of software, uh, which is interesting. I mean, that came up in this roundtable earlier this week in terms of the tools that artists are using. And how Finn, for instance, um, you know, the, the, the complexity of their productions require a team plus to get things done versus someone like Ian Goldstone, who took best of show last year at DG. He writes his own software in C++. Yeah, so, he's using uh, open frameworks, which is really interesting. Right. Well, that, uh, that disparity, that's not a path I'm going to be taking anytime soon. <laughs> um, is, is about as far as I'm going to get at the moment. But, um, well, and so the, the art that's in there, it, it's weird to, to talk about, you know, there is the, the fallacious quality of listening to the artist talk about their work. Um, I don't know about the verity. I don't know about the interest. But the, um, it's just the thing that interests me most is the thing that I grew up with, um, landscapes to begin with but also how it's tied into different emotional qualities of in Colorado, everybody thinks, you know, it's just this wide open uh, paradise notion when it has its own constraints, its own boundaries. So I'm working with boundaries, physical and um, virtual. So uh, some of the work is actually up on a gallery that I'd mentioned earlier, frm.fm. Uh, framed has real-time artwork. And that's one of the things that makes it hard to do game engine art is it's real-time. It's not just captured on video and then posted to um, another, I don't know, another channel. It's like this channel right now we've got. You've got this thing live. Yeah. That's the way the media should be. That's the way it should be experienced. I, I agree wholeheartedly with yeah. you. Yeah, I know you do. <laughs> and it's important. I, I, and, it, and we're getting there. There's a lot more people using it. And that's the well, actually, with the release of uh, Unreal Engine, uh, re did a release yesterday. Uh, they dropped a they dropped a microphone on everybody in the industry and said, "Hey, 
we want to give you a preview of Unity or un, sorry, not Unity, Unreal Engine five. Right. Uh, that's going to be posting next year at some point in 2021, and the rendering quality that they showed was just mind blowing. And it's all done in complete real time. And you know, like they've basically eliminated the restraints of polygon polygon counts, and they've pulled the handcuffs off of like texturing and. They've just done and lighting a lot of a lot of enhancements on lighting, and it's just like these gaming engines are just getting more and more and more uh, advanced to the point where you know we we we're starting to experience real time graphics like it is reality in a lot of different ways. Right, and there's no time to think about it now. <laughs> it's <laughs> it's in a way it's kind of a spooky place to be. Um, because you know that stuff will be released in real time and you won't even know what the heck just happened. Yeah, Unreal yeah. 5. I, you know, I did my time in Unreal. I escaped. <laughs> but I, I wonder about getting back in it because I know that, I mean, I don't know. It has become a little bit more user uh, friendly. It's starting to get there. There's some, there's some good people. There's some really good people in some good places there that are are cranking the gears and definitely yeah. rapidly improving a lot of it. Uh, Tracy was asking, how many pieces of art are available for DG at home? Is there a competition for the use of the best uh, art piece? Wow, interesting question. Well, yeah. No. Well, so the. The DG at home has a, a reel of about 28 artists, maybe 30 on it. Um, when the uh, site goes back up, digitalgraffiti.com will have its archive. Um, oopsie, can you see my fingers crossed? <laughs> to be able to draw on you know, from years past. Uh, so there, there are some different locations, but as I mentioned, you know, I want to start getting these projections up from my um, Instagram just to be able to get the individual artists up and then send you guys there to their artwork, their, to their websites. And that way you can start projecting at, at will. Um, and then what was the second part of that question? Um, is there a competition for the best use of, uh, of, the, of, of an art piece? Alexis, are you on? Are you guys, I don't know if uh, Alice Beach is happening. I know that she was on earlier. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, They. I don't know if they're doing it. There was talk, but I'm sure that there should be you know, an unmentioned competition. So I think what we can do is at least follow up and maybe uh, get some answers and post them uh, in the video after we've, after we've wrapped up. Uh, Adrian Scott mentioned about Notch. Uh, absolutely, I'm a huge fan. As, you, as Brett, Brett actually already knows, I, I'm a huge, huge, huge fan of Notch. Yeah. Um, such so agile, the tool set again for them has been advancing so rapidly. They've been coming out with some amazing stuff, especially for interactive interactive use. Um, Touch Designer, of course, is another one that's been around for ages and has been rapidly, basically, you know, it's been the main tool that has uh, been adapted inside of the digital art community. Uh, I did a poll actually not too long ago and uh, Touch, Touch Designer came back as actually being used as the number one tool that yeah. digital artists are using today to, to generate art. Yep, that's where we are. No, I like you say, there's other engines like Unigen, uh, you know, that you have to find your reason or your intention in using these different tools. Um, Touch Designer is sort of like you say, I mean, they're, I don't know, in terms of popularity, how this stuff works, I don't even know if I need to speculate. <laughs> Unreal just keeps, like you say, raising the, the notch. Uh, they probably are raising. The notch. That's a that's a pretty pretty funny pun. Pretty pretty funny yeah, play on words. You know, they probably work hand in hand in some respects. They just sort of challenge each other. But notch is definitely amazing. Well, notch is definitely built more as a content authoring tool, whereas Unreal is kind of like it's it's the environment. It's the everything. It's the compositing. Right. It's no, yeah. the host, so to so, speak. You're not creating. You're not necessarily creating content inside of Unreal. You're it's hosting it and manipulating no. it and rendering it. That's right. It is the editor. Yeah, it's it's the thing that pulls everything together. Um, no, I don't know that you know like Mad Mapper should be talked about possibly um, because there are some different ways into getting um, 
at least some projection art out there. But I know if you have any other questions, I don't know if anybody does because you do have a savvy audience. But you know, hit me up and I'll give you some other ideas as well on tools um, from from the artist side. Like you say, the when you're on large production, um, there's probably fewer tools to use because you have a deadline and you have a client and you have a reason to get something done immediately. <laughs> DG's got this huge experimental <laughs> component that doesn't have the same kind of, you know, aspect as a huge production. Yeah, friends don't let friends render. Yeah, that's that's pretty funny. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you got a real five, I guess you don't have to worry about it. <laughs> these friends. That's fun. It's going to be interesting in my in my world, inside of the media server world, and the world that I live in. It's going to be really, really interesting to see how things adapt and how things uh, evolve and change throughout the course of the next several years. It's going to be really, really interesting. Yeah. Oh, October for October picks. What are the artists using? Um, a multitude of different things. True. No, yeah, no. I know you've got e is Ian. Um, I know uh, Finn is Finn is Notch. Very heavy notch uh, designer. Um, there are some people just using, you know, ink on paper. Um, nothing. Yeah. Too, some shadows on a wall, but um, but you're right. There, you know, Ian writes his own. He has his own game engine, um, and I'm thinking. I mean, Mad Mapper, you know, Adobe After Effects. The, the you know the tools that I hear about on the more well, yeah I, after definitely uh, definitely uh, After Effects being a staple in the industry and has been just used by so many people. Um, yep. Photoshop. But, yeah, yeah, there's so many tools, and you're seeing people just getting really creative. I mean, a lot of stop action still being used. Uh, a lot of different t uh, uh, photographic technologies being used. Uh, the really interesting trends that I've been seeing a lot lately is data-driven, data-driven uh, visualizations and people experimenting with tons and tons of different types of data that are accessible off the web and parsing that and displaying that in, in all kinds of different um, types of things. Isabel, can you submit right now? Can She asks if she can submit something right now. You can, just go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so how how would you go about doing send that? It to, send it to me. I mean, you had my I think you had my email address up there. Maybe it's on this site elsewhere, but it's Brett at genanxiety.com. Um, that I'll see what you got, and um, we'll go from there. But Sweet. Yeah, no, that'd be good. Um, <laughs> it's funny how, like you say, I know. Jeffrey, you'd love, I mean, that's like one of your big things, right? You want to turn DG into a real-time festival. Uh, but I, you know, being global, um, having that kind of insight from a, from a worldwide community is important, but I like being able to bring in any kind of media. And like you say, stop action or any of these other sorts of ways of seeing light. Yeah. I like having the access to it. I, you know, I, it hasn't gone away. Um, it might just become real-time media because, like you say, Unreal said so. This is what we're going to do. Um, and there won't be any more painting on canvas. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the whole essence of DG. So, Brett, dude, I just wanted to thank you again for your time here, man. I really, really oh, appreciate thanks. you being on board. And, and going through this has just been a lot of fun and it's been great having you on. Uh, for those that are still viewing, um, I'm also actually gonna be revisiting Bart Cressa. He's got an interesting thing going on as well. Um, he's back out in the desert and out in Vegas doing some stuff live. So I'm gonna be uh, on, on his um, show or actually on his site tomorrow at sujimojo.org. Uh, so we'll be just kind of doing another you know, real time conversation with him and hopefully getting a little behind the scenes action of how he's been doing out there and setting things up. So that'll be 5 p.m. tomorrow evening. And uh, yeah, 
Just wanted to thank, oh, I guess we got Friday. Uh, DJ at home will be featuring fa Flashback Friday. Ooh. So that'll be awesome. That'll be awesome. But just wanted to thank you guys for all of your input, for all of your support again, uh, you know, for, for being so innovative and being so creative and uh, and just sharing all these moments and sharing these times with us. So thank you once again for everything. And Brett, thank you so, so much for being on board. Thank you. Great. Oh, and I guess uh, just one last little thing. Digital Graffiti's got uh, to tune in to 38's Facebook Live trivia for the opportunity for free tickets for the festival this fall. So that'd be cool. Okay. Cool little tidbit too. But thanks again, everybody. Thanks for tuning in today. Bye-bye. <laughs> and of course, stay ahead of the curve. <laughs> <laughs>